from the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street, right next to the High Museum of Art in Midtown Atlanta, welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. I'm Senior Pastor Tony Sundermeyer, and I want to thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. And I would invite you now to join us in the worship of God. We continue our summer journey together through the parables of Jesus. This week we look to the Gospel writer Matthew. The 18th chapter, beginning in the 23rd verse, concluding with verse 35. Friends, listen to God's Word uh, to you and to me. Jesus said, For this reason, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who'd owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, break open your word afresh to us this day so that we would be different people than those who came into this sacred space uh, this morning, even to be more like your son, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name that we pray, amen. Well, for the record, I am not naive to the challenges inherent in the context and the backdrop and the language of this parable. A capricious monarch, slavery, slave trading when a debt is not paid, and torture. All of these things are not what I think of when I think of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For Jesus to use these even in a parabolic sense so as to communicate some truth about the kingdom of God can be, for the modern hearer, a bit of a turnoff. Preachers might urge us to see the forest through the trees so that the deeper spiritual truth of this text may be unearthed from, to borrow a phrase from Anne Henley's sermon last week, unearthed from the rocky and thorny soil of standardized, dehumanizing practices that once were, that today we strive against and seek to undo. Still, such encouragement, see the forest through the trees, might be met with a bit of skepticism. You see, for some, uh, these types of stories, these types of stories are enough for them to disregard sacred texts and abandon any 
religious commitment they may have thought of possessing because the portrayal of God within these particular texts seems to be so incongruent with their understanding or their sense of the divine character. In their own heart and in their own mind, they just don't think God is like this, that God is like the way that God is being portrayed in these texts, right? I mean, in this text alone, God seems to be portrayed as a capricious deity, demanding payment in one moment, in the next forgiving a great debt, and then in the next moment reassessing that debt because the servant who owed that debt was not merciful in his own right to one of his co-workers. It appears from within this text that God's mercy has conditions, that God's grace has limits. God will be merciful to those who show mercy and to those that do not show mercy. Those folk God will hand over, says the parable, to be tortured until the loan can be paid. For reformed, theologically minded communities like ours, for Presbyterians, who hold two central theological convictions that really anchor our faith and our life together from that theological perspective. Number one, that God's grace is not dependent upon our works. We just sang about it in that great hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, that we cannot do this on our own, that we cannot deliver ourselves that God's grace is not dependent upon our works, including our works of mercy or lack thereof mercy. And number two, that God's grace cannot be rescinded, nor can we lose our salvation once it is freely given to us and once it is received. With these two things in mind, these, these central and core convictions of our theological life, this parable presents a serious challenge. How do we proceed? How, how do we interpret such a word in the midst of such a challenge? I, I think the first step that we take in trying to understand this text, its meaning for our lives, is to ask a question of intent. A question of intent. Why is Jesus telling this parable in the first place? Why did Matthew seem it to be good and right to include it in his good news account of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I think part of the answer lies within the bit that immediately precedes the telling of this parable. We didn't read it this morning, but many of you have heard this before. Peter who was a follower of Jesus, one of his closest friends, once says to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? You've heard this before. And Peter says, should I forgive them seven times? And Jesus says, no, not seven times. And depending on the English version that you have and how they interpret the Greek, it says something like, no, not seven times, but I tell you 77 times. Now, the number Jesus gives is symbolic here. He does not literally mean 77 times and on the 78th time while you're out of luck. Seven is a number that represents completeness. It represents perfection. And in this case, 77 conveys a sense that the offerings of forgiveness to those who have wronged us should be infinite. They should be infinite. In other words, our forgiveness should know no end. But we must be clear at this point. True forgiveness is not void of boundaries. True forgiveness is not void of consequences. True forgiveness is not void of memory. True forgiveness is not void of justice. As Lutheran pastor Pam Marola puts it, don't ever mistake forgiveness for taking the burden of the crime off the offender and putting it on yourself. For how destructive is it? We've seen it happen, maybe in our own lives, when one who has been violated begins to blame themselves for their injury and not the one who actually caused them harm. 
If you're living in that reality, you are not living into forgiveness. Forgiveness produces a different outcome. I would contend that true forgiveness is exemplified by the embodied decision not to render evil for evil, pain for pain, hurt for hurt. True forgiveness breaks cycles of injury and wrongdoing and subsequently liberates the one who has been injured. True forgiveness frees us from the need for revenge. It liberates us from the need to live by the motto, an eye for an eye, which as Gandhi put it so well, is a perspective that simply leaves the whole world blind. Martin Luther King Jr., a student of Gandhi, was fond of telling a story about a time that he and his brother A.D. were driving from here in Atlanta north to Chattanooga. A.D. was driving the car, and for some reason, as cars passed them by in the opposite direction, those cars would not dim their headlights. This was a common courtesy that one could expect. Even today, when you're driving on the road and, and someone comes with their high beams, it's expected as a common courtesy that they would turn down their high beams so as to not blind the, the driver who is coming toward them in the opposite lane. Well, as the, the drive continued, A.D. grew more and more angry at the lack of courtesy afforded to him by the other drivers. And at one point, he looked at his brother Martin, and he said, Martin... I tell you what I'm going to do. The next time someone comes driving past us with their lights on full power, I'm turning mine up all the way. And I'm going to I'm going to edge the car into their sight line and I'm going to blind them as they come toward us. And Martin said, "Oh no. Oh no, don't do that. Be too much light on this highway and it will end up in mutual destruction." for all. Somebody, he said, has to have some good sense on this highway. Someone has to dim their lights. I had a moment of conviction after I had decided that I was going to use this story in my sermon this morning. I was driving with my boys, and as we were going through our neighborhood in Ansley Park, there are a lot of yield signs that people do not follow. <laughs> and I have this horrible habit that when I'm entering into a circle and I have the right of way and I see somebody speeding to enter the circle, I will speed up to try to cut them off from getting into the circle. I had a moment of conviction. I decided I'm telling the story. John, our oldest son, who you saw earlier, said, Dad, every time you do that, you're going to hit the car. You're going to hit the other car. I said, I'm not going to do that. This, this literally, this happened. I'm driving in the circle and I start speeding up as I see a car. My tires go over the curb. I'm lucky I did not puncture the tires on my left-hand side. And Johnny said, see, Dad, someone's got to yield. Someone's got to slow down, or it's going to be destruction for everybody. Somebody's got to yield. Somebody's got to dim their lights. One of the core components of Dr. King's theology, an idea embedded in his writing and his preaching and his leadership, was the notion that at some level, at some level, we all have power. King believed that. At some level, we all have power. In his worldview, even the most vulnerable, even the most oppressed, even the most marginalized among us still have, still possess a modicum of power. We all have the power, he would say, to respond to hate with love. We all have the power, he would say, to respond to injury with forgiveness. We all have the power, he would say, to meet violence with nonviolence. We all have the power, he would say, to confront sin with mercy. See, King viewed his Atlanta to Chattanooga drive as an example of exercising one's power to break the cycles human beings are so adept at perpetuating. First King preached and reminded us many, many times, hate begets hate, violence begets violence, force begets force. These cycles must be broken, and King had an unwavering conviction that by the grace of God, by God's grace, those cycles could indeed end. They could be broken. And we break them through acts of forgiveness, acts of mercy, and acts of love. 
it's within our power to dim the lights. The Christian's resolve for forgiveness should be boundless. The Christian's resolve to forgive should be endless, even as we acknowledge that forgiveness does not seek to eliminate culpability or boundaries or memory or offense or justice. Forgiveness is a powerful act that does not minimize the injury. It does not minimize the offense, but it does seek to break cycles that offend. It seeks to put an end to it right then, right there. Cycles that would lead to destruction and make the whole world blind. In some ways, in some ways, not in every way, but in some ways, this parable, the parable of the unforgiving servant, is about these destructive cycles. This parable is about these cycles and how one can be liberated from them. As we get into the text, we're, we're immediately confronted with a great absurdity, and it's found in the debt that the first servant owes the king. And it's one of the key components of this particular passage. And I think it's best understood, to, to see the absurdity of this debt, it's best understood if we sort of present an, a contemporary economic equivalent. So I want to do that for us this morning, okay? So, so Jesus said that this servant owed the king 10,000 talents. One talent, just one single talent, was the equivalent to 15 years of wages for a day laborer. 15 years. Just one of those talents. So frame it in today's terms. Let's say a migrant farmer, and this is very generous, let's say a migrant farmer works 15, for $15 an hour, works 40 hours a week, 52 weeks per year, times 15 years per talent, times 10,000 talents. And what you have is a loan of $4.68 billion. It's absurd. It's absurd. There could not possibly be a loan that great. So this servant indebted at $4.68 billion to the king we're told, also holds a loan over another servant. And if you do the math on that loan, that one comes to a whopping $12,000. Do you get the point? You get the point. The Christian should keep in mind our debt to God and how much God has forgiven us when we go out and claim a debt owed to us. That's part of the meaning of this text that we should keep in mind what a great debt God has forgiven us, our sin and our sinful nature, when we go out to confront the sins of somebody else. But that's not the only point. For the king, you know, in some ways I wish this story would just end right there, right? But it doesn't. The, the king, upon hearing that this first servant locked up his colleague for an infinitesimally smaller loan, the king becomes angry, and he calls the first servant in, and subsequently, and this is what our English version of the New Testament reads, how it reads, handed him over to be tortured until he could pay his debt. And then Jesus makes it worse by concluding in verse 35, so my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I mean, how do we make sense of a statement like that one when our theological core affirms God's grace and God's mercy and forgiveness that once it is offered and received that it can never be rescinded? I mean, how do we deal with that? Because that's what the parable says happens. A great loan is canceled, only to be reassessed by the king upon hearing the lack of mercy shown by one servant to another. And we have to ask the question, is that how God works? Is God this king who in one moment would forgive and in the next take it away? Let me offer this in closing. I do not believe there is a clear-cut resolution to that question. I just don't know of one. I do, however, have a few considerations that I'd like to offer that maybe, maybe open up 
a road of integrity where the scripture and our theological convictions come together. I think we first have to acknowledge that this parable is not about the sweet by and by. And this is really important. This parable is not about heaven. This parable is about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, which is simply code in the New Testament. It is code for the reign of God on earth as it is in heaven. On earth, right now, in our midst as it is in heaven. And this particular section of Matthew 18 is located in a larger conversation about how church folk, it's about church folk, how church folk, how brothers and sisters in Christ, how they get along with each other, how they love each other, how they care for each other, how they show compassion with one another, not in heaven, but on earth. Right now, in this time and in this place, the church should be a community, a demonstration, and a provisional witness of what it looks like when cycles of destruction are destroyed by merciful, forgiving, and loving communities. So this king, who we assume is God, sees that someone in God's beloved community is perpetuating cycles of destruction. God sees, the king sees someone perpetuating and an eye for an eye way of being human in the world. And God decides that this way of being has no place in the church. It has no place in the kingdom of God and the text itself, in the original Greek, as it often happens, actually reads slightly differently than it's presented to us in our English translation. Verse 34 literally states, there's a subtle nuance, but it makes a huge difference, literally states, the king handed him over to the torturers, or some translations say, the jailers. Handed him over to the torturers. The king doesn't torture. So it's no better. The king's handing him over to the torturers. But follow me here. The king hands him over to the torturers, the tormentors, the jailers. And interestingly, this word, torturers, if you were here a few weeks ago, it's the same Greek word, basanos. It has the same root, which, which refers to a touchstone, right? A touchstone that, that would be hit against the metal, or metal would be hit against it, and it would, it would reveal its authenticity or its inauthenticity that the torture in the parabolic sense means to expose someone for who they really are. And the same word is being applied in this parable and in this place. And in the case of Matthew 18, this unforgiving servant is exposed as one who lacks the awareness of the magnitude of that which he has been forgiven. He also lacks a compassion and care for the worker that is indebted to him. He is exposed as one who is all about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And God makes a judgment on that. Some of us don't want God to make judgments. God makes a judgment on that way of being human. God says if that person wants to live that way, then they cannot be part of the church. They, they, they have to be handed over to the true community to which they belong. A community of tormentors, a community of torturers, a community who goes after the people who owe them something and grabs their neck and won't let go until the debt is paid. And maybe these tormentors and torturers in this parable are also code. Maybe, maybe it's also code for communities and individuals who spiritually, emotionally, and physically grab you by the throat until you pay up. You see, here's what God's grace affords us. This is what God's grace affords us in real time, right now. You and I can decide, we can decide, we have freedom to choose whether we're going to emulate God's mercy, forgiveness, and love, or we're going to disregard it 
in our interactions with ourselves and with others. I mean, listen, this, this is a hard word. I said at the 8.30 service, this is not a Christmas Eve or Easter Sunday sermon, right? I mean, this is, in my family, we, we, we'd say this is a kitchen table talk kind of sermon. You don't talk about this stuff in front of your guests at the dinner table. This is the hard word when it comes to being the church. That God is willing God is willing to hand us over to the eye for an eye tormentors if that's how we want to live. God's willing to do that if that's what we want, if that's how we choose to use our freedom. God's willing to hand us over if we want to be people who are about vengeance and returning pain for pain, hurt for hurt, then God says, have at it. God hands us over to that way of being human, but that way, friends, that way, make no mistake about it, ends in destruction. It ends in destruction. It will destroy us. It will destroy marriages. It will destroy relationships. It will destroy families. It will destroy churches and communities and the world. God's grace does not limit our freedom, and we are unbound to choose whether we forgive others or choose to grab them by the throat. One response brings us into the kingdom. The other perpetuates cycles of destruction. One response brings liberation to us, and the other brings enslavement to revenge and suffering. God's gracious response offers us the freedom to choose forgiveness or to choose a life of torment. Which will you choose? Amen. Something happens almost every week after the acolytes light the candles and as they walk out, they snuff them out and they walk out and there's like a moment right here where you cannot see the light. It's gone on the wick. And our great acolyte Gavin was holding it up nice and high to get the airflow, and it lights again. <laughs> and he walks the light out into the world. It's a great image. It's a great image because it reminds us that, that, that we're, uh, the church has been living in seasons of history where it seems like the church's light is going out, where, where you can no longer see that bright light set on a hill, the way the church has been called to live. And in this way, think of it very differently than dimming the lights. We want to let our light shine. And don't we need right now to have the church's light shine? I mean, more than maybe in many of our memories right now, we need the church to be the church and to let that light shine. And that light shines in acts of forgiveness, mercy, and grace.